Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Wistrand, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Kennan Institute. Thank you for joining us for a screening and discussion of Ghulam Magan, The Unexonerated, a documentary that tells the story of more than 18,000 people who were designated as extremists by the government of Uzbekistan under the leadership of the late President Islam Karimov. This documentary was supported by the AXA Society for Central Asian Affairs. Before we begin, I'd like to encourage you to stay up to date on the Kennan Institute's work by visiting our website and signing up for our events, blogs, and podcasts. Now, I'm honored to introduce our two guests, Noah Tucker and Amina Umarov. I'm gonna introduce Noah first, because Noah's gonna speak before we watch the documentary, and then I will introduce Amina after the documentary, because she's going to speak afterwards. Noah Tucker is a senior research consultant for the OXA Society for Central Asian Affairs and the producer of today's film. He is also a program associate with George Washington University's Central Asia program, and he holds the Honda studentship at the Honda Center for the Study of Terrorism and Political Violence at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Noah has been studying Central Asia since 2002, and he has spent more than six years living and working in the region primarily in Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan. Uh, quick reminder also before I ask Noah to give some introductory remarks and then before we turn to the documentary, uh, we are gonna have a question and answer session for the last part of our hour long gathering today. So if you would like to submit a question, and we hope you do wanna submit one, you can do so in one of three ways. And you can do that anytime during Noah's comments, during the documentary or during Amina's comments. You can submit those questions via email to kennan at wilsoncenter.org, via Twitter at Kennan Institute, or via our Facebook page. Noah, please. Sorry, that's probably the first of many times that I'm gonna make that mistake, uh, even after three years of practice after the pandemic. Um, but thank you very much uh, for having me. Um, you know, this is the second screening now that the Wilson Institute has hosted, um, and we're just we're deeply grateful um, to be here and really excited to have such a large group of people gathered here today. And I, I won't hold you up too much um, on screening the film because I'd really like to have the opportunity um, to hear from Amina and to hear your questions and to discuss things together with everyone. But I'll give a little bit of background. Um, so in 2016, Islam Karimov um, died uh, after being leader of Uzbekistan um, for something around 24 years uh, from the time he was first party sec first first secretary of the Communist Party during the Soviet period uh, for the Uzbek Soviet Socialist Republic, and transitioned uh, into becoming the first elected president of uh, the independent nation uh, of the Republic of Uzbekistan um, in 1992. And um, during that time, uh, it's pretty well established. Um, a number of the uh, pretty well established and heavily criticized by the international community, um, the moves that he made against religious freedom, um, people who were arrested on suspicion of extremism uh, for engaging in political opposition and for engaging in ordinary religious activities that are not only perfectly legal everywhere else in the world, but under the law are perfectly legal inside Uzbekistan and under its constitution. Um, it was widely understood uh, during his lifetime and during a lot of his reign that in addition to the legal penalties that were brought against people suspected of extremism, that there was a long list of others who were kept on what was called a blacklist, uh, um, that was an extra, extra legal um, means that they used to discriminate against people who found themselves on the list for a wide variety of extra reasons. Although the government um, for years denied the existence of um, any kind of extra legal punishment that way. After Karimov's death, um, he was succeeded by Shafkat Mirzioyev. And um, I think much to the 
surprise but relief um, of a lot of people who have pushed for these things for many years, myself included, and, and many of my friends in Uzbekistan and elsewhere. Um, one of the first really significant reforms that Mirziorov made was to abruptly acknowledge the existence of the blacklist and to acknowledge that uh, that hundreds and hundreds of people had been imprisoned essentially without just cause and without due process under the laws they were due. And he made really an incredible uh, cardinal reform to the legal system by announcing the release of uh, first 16,000 and then later up to 18,000 people from both uh, the prison system and from this blacklist that unofficially prevented people from access to employment, from access to public goods, and uh, really from their ability to safely interact with even family members and things like that. Um, so this was an incredible reform. And one of our goals in making this film and in doing the screening today is to celebrate that reform and to celebrate that change, a really significant change. Um, but in the process, um, in the years that followed after so many people were released, we didn't hear a lot um, in public and in the public sphere about their lives, about their stories and about what their lives were like now. And so a couple of years ago, um, we at Oxus submitted a grant proposal um, to make a film that would serve as a study, first of all, of what their lives were now uh, and to dig deeper into this reform. And what we found um, was a little bit different than what we expected. Um, and I won't say too much about it. You'll see it now um, in the stories of those um, who talk about their lives. What we have tried to make um, with this film is an opportunity for people who were formerly silenced um, in every way possible, um, legal and uh, extra legal, um, official and unofficial to tell their own stories in their own way. Um, and so you'll hear that some of the stories seem to contradict one another um, in some ways. And this is a tension that we just have to hold um, because this is a tension that exists uh, within, within Uzbek society today. And I think I want to invite us as we watch this, as we listen to these stories that have not been told before, as we listen to these stories and see the different ways that people choose to tell their own life narrative about their intersection um, with the justice system, with the prison system and their lives after, um, I wanna invite us to think about how questions that don't apply just to formerly authoritarian or current authoritarian states, but to our democratic societies increasingly uh, in the West and in the United States in particular, questions about whose stories can be heard, who is allowed to tell their story, um, whose truth counts, whose suffering counts, and whose pain is legible to us, whose stories can we hear and hold and still have still understand ourselves as an us, um, as a society and um, as a people, and what are the barriers um, for people who have endured tremendous suffering to telling those stories, in part because it changes the way that we have to think about ourselves um, as a broader society and as a political system. Um, so with that, uh, I'll be really happy uh, just to watch the film with you all. Uh, I'm really, really thrilled to have Amina Umarov here with us today to tell her family story and her own story, and then we'll be really happy to take questions and, and hear your own thoughts.
Cümmet tamamından hiç kendi tosuklar bulmayan. Kız bu tahriye. Ancak akımlar payda bulmayan ve bu akımlar ki meçhiller ne oldu da dökenler de her türlü kitablar başına da bir malı satılıyor. Kerimov şu hemen her sene tek koyup koyup ki gün bir tane ki o 98. yılda dini etkatı gibi bir kanun da çıkar ve bir yüzyıl tokuzuncu karar hükümeti cinayet pratik olduysa ki kırıtır. Mesut dini etkatı ki adamlarda yani hizmet akıl akımı da ayıblab kamaştı başlarda. Ete ni Siri, ni Irak, ni Afganistan, ni Uzbekistan, ni Kazakistan, ete ni teritoriya, ete lüdi, ete lüdi, которые должны услышать, увидеть и немножко сочувствовать. Тогда человек сам найдет в себе силы. А не услышанным быть это очень сложно, очень сложно. И многие люди совершают суицид только из-за того, что они не услышаны. Yaşlanıyorsun. <gülüyor> Sana muşalardan eken sandım, o şey Galoni numaralar, o şey vakit geçti bende. Ne göre değil ki o barak, o şey yanım ki varak antaşar, şu senden çıktı dedim, ben varak tarkat kendim yok dedim. Ne hizbu tahrir azalara varak tarkat kim? Yani o varak an o şey manası Müslümanlar Müslüda Yahudi ne hakim ne kılış haram derdi kim varak? Şu varak an tarkat kim sandım, maniyem o şey ki Abkete gördü ve o şey alt gün kıyınab şu ayetlerle koştu. Varak tarkat kendim yok. Doğru ben hiz bu tahr azasım ben. Bu kıyafetim o şey hiz bu tahr azası bu sen aşın o ziyet aldı sen geldi. Biz ailemiz ge kandı bir katta musibet çıkan bosa. Hıttı şu musibet diye minilab. Yüz milyar adamdan başka bir şey Такие времена были, люди вообще не знали, даже есть, что такие можно, куда обращаться, есть такие люди, как суротаки, правозащитники, или адвокатам обращаться. Они не знали простой свои права и обязанности. Они бедные, вот даже их, когда с улицы забирали, они имели право, вот, например, на адвоката, им даже адвокат не давали. Они формально там находились, но в основном были в подвалах, где уже над ними начинались уже уголовные дела, чтобы вот эти питки, чтобы они сокращались, чтобы давление на них не было. Вот они на пустые бумаги подписывали. На все согласны были они. Bu 
Uzbekistan'da müstakil insan haklarından şüllenerek yani müstakil teşkilatın azasıydı. Yani Uzbekistan insan haklar hukuki tayin, e, Uzbekistan insan haklar cemiyetiydi. <gülüyor> Bu e, cemiyetin aksariyeti o işe burpaytlar e, sabık e, e, istirdi davurda yok. Teşkil topkan Uzbekistan'da şu siyasi partiler yani İRK ve Birlik Partiyası'nın azalarıydı. Ve bunların, bizim taşkılatın asosçuları, şu İRK ve Birlik Partiyası'nın asosçuları Uzbekistan'da ıı, takip geçirildiğinden ki, müstakil insan hukukları bulan şu olan arıgan taşkılatı açtı. Ama şu Uzbekistan insan hukukları cemiyatın sırdarı veriyat bölümü reis edin. Şu sebeple faaliyetimde şu siyasi muhut kutarı olmadı. Doğru ve şundan ki, ıı, üydürme ayıbılar bulan, manga nispetten şu cinayeti şu açıp, azaltıktan mahrum kıldı. İkimiyinci yıllarda birinci başlangıç payetlerde ikimi beşinci yıldan sonra ancak vakıllardan ki kamaqanlarda dini mahpuslar tolip getken yada törmüyde mojellengen kamaqanada ona kimi on üç mü adam kamağda sahlengen kamaqanlar tolip getken yada nabat buyurda hava ısık cüda bir kıyın ahvalda yaşasken bular ham. Çünkü çün bular ki albargın azı vakıllarda amide vakıl babargın göşe aynı palada üç günde kırıt müde kamaqana ge. Aynı kısa dini etkiden hamalgelerde nabat ya koyup bayağıdır. Şu halatlarda cüda köp ata onalar, herzandları hamadali payıdı da bir kançalarının ataları onaları ölüp gitti. Aileler, bir kança aileler büzüldü. Hatırları çıdamazdan başka türmüş kurup yetişti. Ata onaları iktisadi tamamen barı almazdan oğullarına zor intizarlıydı ölüp yetişti. Cüda katlı repressiyeler oldu. Yani ham masal o tüm maskta mı var ne ya şu kut tüm mekanımız dende başka bir mekanımız. Ne var ne tüm mekanımız? Şu dende tüm maskta mı var ne? Dende tüm mey bayağı kadar kum ne madde şu da şu. Ara başka bir amız da şu dünyalar ya. Şu payda 31 yaşlardaydım. Asal sebebim ilimsizlik oldu. Yani ilim örgün işte ve ilimsizlikten oldu. Çünkü ilimimiz yok oldu. Ben asal örgün işte hiç kaçan ilimimiz olmadı. İlim örgüt edigen insanlar kendi cüde yani. Biz bu ataklarda yok desem bolardı. Yine kamal geldi. Ama kanada örgüyüm ben zonada tabak say, dostum tamam tabak tabak say zonasında örgüyüm ben ustazlarım ben. Yurt var ne kadar ustazımız var ede, vahad ne kadar ustazımız var ede, ikram ne kadar ustazlarımız var ede. Ben aşk işlerden kanada örgüyüm ben. Oyma kalmıyor, ne kaşlı, derme, çizişler mi örgüyüm ben, ne aç çizişler mi? Başka ne aşlar mı? Şu gül bir kitem ben aslında onlar sizin güllerden ayrı mı ilgili gül ne ne aşlar mı bir kitem ben de? Şu onlar rahmetli çizgim güllerden kalıp. Çizip çizip kursta ben. İşin lazım esin okup edip. Hemen şimdi esin de onam çizip edip. Rasımız gibi çizip çizip çizip ne çıralı çizip koyardı. Onam en az gül çizip çizip koyardı. Umumi organda işe ben caslıkta bulamda. Bu arada yani umumi kontingentinin gidiyordu bir 30-35 foyizi dini Matipta kamal gelen yani 199 cumanda 244 ya ki şu gün okşaş. Kamer ne sistem oluyor da, o şey jasla kamal konasta, her bir konada 12 tane mahkum bulardı, 12 tane. Şundan tahminen şu turp tası ya ki 5 tası, 3 tası şu dini statemle kamal gelen. 
Aynen o işe bitti Hanada Bulgan'ı bulan umumi istatya, başka uygulamak istatyalarla başka bir münasabat, Brüzeli Tok istatyalarla ama başka bir münasabat bulan. No? Uyurga o işe bağırıp cüda köp hukuklarda. Mesela Özbekistan'da o işe cinayet icroi kodeksini Brüzeli'ye yettiğin için modda talepleri cüda hem köp buzulgan. O işe de insanla nisbeten umman adam sıfatı da karamagan doimi tahkırlaşlar, doimi şey, basımlar. E, cismani kıynaklar var, ruhi kıynaklar bulan. Allah'u Ekber. Kamalgenden ki, ben adışken eken ben, ben bilmeyi kop ben, ben bilmezsen şu iş tıklayıp, bakıp koyup ben, digen narsana, şu kürs atışlığı için, e, hakikaten basın tazikler, e, hatta ki şu basın tazikler orası da bir kança adamlar canı üzüldü, şahit buldu. Namaz okumaydık onlar hem var, hatta ki o şey, ne müçün kamel genliğini ozu bilmeydik onlar hem var. Ne müçün kamelde, ne müçün e, o şey, e, onu kamel koyuştu, bilmeydi ozu. E, Hala ki bazı birileri o şey payıttı, Adamlar diye de sal abrolü rabolup şu hükümet ya karşı yaptı ya para koyuyor musun? Müladen ama var kama koyuyorlar ya. Ne olur söz müneti kendi o işe jahsı kama kanası, nafakat jahsı kama kanası. Uzbekistan turmalarda o işe radikal kayfiyatta bugün dini ekstremistik taşkırat azalar bugallar var. Hakikat muman demokratik tuzum bu ya da kufur tuzum bu umman biz bu bulan yaşaması gerek biz de halifalik gerek a, bu kufur tuzumu dedi e, aşka oraya itadı man e, hiç kaçan bu tuzumga raz bu mi man demokrat tuzum bu biz dinimizde bu ya NATO olmazsa a, radikal e, hakikaten cüdeyem radikal kayfiyatta da dini istatı da mahkumlar var lekin ayrımları uşa muman uşa nakanga radikal Dini statedeki adamlar kana kadar kucaklarda yığılışlar ve kırıp kalıp bir marta ya ki iki marta kırıp bu şehirde hiç kana kengi kubuş kana kengi radikal kayfiyat tuzu ama yok kama katışkan kundan prensident namı ve af namı yazadı hamişe lakin ulara mazadlık çıkarılmay şu da yığırma illerden artık oturgan mahkumlarım yok amas ve o ta o şey kerim vafatıga kadar caslık kama kanası uzun ing Cirkanç rejim bulan, utabar kat rejim bulan. Mana hayatımda, nafakat mana, ben kabu onla yüzler mahkumlarına hayatı da unutulmaz bur karar vakıyla sıfatı da kalla. Bu ben uz ailem torusu da yapar derken ben, sadece ben katta cihanım ki on dokuzlu kamar cihaz birliyordu. Ve o on dokuz yarım yıl kamağda oturup geldi. Ondan ki gün, e, ben oğlum Abdullah. Onge on altı yıl kamağ cezası verildi. Üç yarım yıl koşup, iki yıl var statiyemine, on dokuz yarım yılda geldi. Üçüncü oğlum Habibullah'a dokuz yıl kamağ cezası verildi. Bunu bir marata üç yarım yıl koştu. Ki gün on altı yarım yıl koştu. Ahırda iki bin onuncu yılda olsa, on yedi yıl kamağ cezası verip, dokuz yıl birinci kamağ cezasını yirmi yedi yıl o. 27 yıl, 27 yıl, 5 ay 8 gün kamağı cazası belgeleşti. 27 yıl, 9 aylıydı, 9 yıl kamağı cazası. Ve bunu ben bir neçen maratıbı, Ali Sud Mahkemesi'ye, başka bir kança mahkemelerine, kayıta görüp çıkışlarını sonra bergen arizalarını inovatka olunmadı. Ve lakin şu halkara taşkilatlar arkayla araylaşkanlığı ve Allah'ın inovaya hidratı bilen, Oğlum 27 demez, 21 yarım yılda Hanadan'a kayıtıp geldi. Вы знаете, в 2018 году наш президент объявил большую амнистию для тех, которые люди были радикальны и которые, зная и не зная, попадали в религиозный экстремизм. Более 18 тысяч людей были освобождены из мест заключения. 
Тогда нам на горячую линию начали поступать звонки о трудоустройстве. Многие люди говорили, вот я был осужден, но не могу трудоустроиться. Мы начали поднимать эту проблему совместно с Министерством управления занятости и трудовых взаимоотношений, и наш юрист начал заниматься их трудоустройством. Дини экстремизм был Камалгаллар, Азадлика Чиканаки, Улорга, чем Бошка Стетеда Камала, Азадлика Чиканаки, Улорга, Киро, Махалла, Хокимия, или Силовая структура, Бутун Махалла, да, Улорга, Каши, Пропаганда, Каган, Карим, Припресия, Сада, Урда. Одам Ларда, Онгада, Ушинаса, Коган, Бу, Террарис, Халх Душману, Ватан Хойн, и она Чихте, Бу, Була, Тешина, Яхшуса, Камала, Китама, Якимуса. Уларда ишка ишбирочу, ман бизнесменлерам уларга ишбиришка куркада даро. Некин уларга бринчо орнда ишсизлик маммас нечкерек иш. Психологик, рухи и анака нама иштмой хаятка куник шбойча. Ханакадар уларна фарзантларга я ки ойласига, турмушортага я узига, жамиятка кушулуб китадига мбар ханакадар программалар калишкерек. Модди финансуи ярдам биришкерек уларга, чунки жуда купу. Амаллаб, что харан тоишки я шеят халас, жуда купа. Агар да умуми чихатнам, ман билядиган хазарге пайтте меше фаргане, шахре марглон, шахре ташлах район, хоштепа район, язава район, шо ортадик атраф мдеги бир 300 на 400 гиакан кеген махбуслар дина бат киладиган басек. Мене шо икими игрманчи игрман бранчилде, агар оладиган басам. یکی از داشت و تو رزیا خن آدم در آلاتی هم مثلاً بلارد اون پایز هم دولت تمامی اشکی جای دارن یعنی نیست. حتی اونو بیش پایز اشکی جای دارم اگر دولت تمامی بلارد هم مثلاً از کس کار بایشه، از حرکت خلب اشیانی تاب کیت کن اشلی هفت. اشیانی تاب کیت مگن جدا خیلی اخوال داره اشلی هفت. و بلارد کیوبشی لیگن عائله سب زلیان یه شر جایی نیست. چونکی بلارد اون تو کسی یه رمیل خم آدای هفت. Наверное, это проблема в отношении осужденных, как дискриминация и стигма. Сам осужденный, у него комплекс проблем получается. Заниженная самооценка, абсолютная неуверенность, отсутствие профессиональных навыков. Даже в семье возникают конфликты. И эти люди нуждаются в психосоциальном сопровождении. Потому что многие жены продали квартиры, многие жены развелись заочно, они остали, оставили перед фактом своего супруга, если мы говорим о... Это и женщины тоже. Мы не говорим только о осужденных мужчинах, это и женщины. Ирим Камалгер, да, не на самом деле, да, не на самом деле, да, не на самом деле, да, не на самом деле, да, не на самом деле, да, не на самом деле, да, не на самом деле, да, не на самом деле, да, не на самом деле, да, не на самом деле, да, не на самом деле, да, не на самом деле, да, не на самом деле, да, не на самом Крыльбюса, крыльбюса, и только хамар там, но я китар, но до сата вама или штопки ампулом, газгабусу, свитгабусу, кимки чагабусу, ты мои шляры. Учили, да? Я научил берунда. Учили, да? Я научил берунда. Учили, да? Учили, да? Учили, да? Учили, да? Учили, да? Учили, да? اکلارم ده تا اما کلارم آرگان دیش لرد. و تا اما کم تشکین ده اسیم بی بیش لرد. اما کم یه آنگه یاردم بیرون دستم. یه دست سعی کنم ای یاردم بیرون میم خونم دن کی میده دب. یاردم کمادو. خونم دی ایره هم اسیم بین باش لگی ده تشکین ده. خبرایی تو من دم. اما که اگه یاردم میاری دستم، اول دم یاردم قمار. بس سیاست که خوشش میمیزدی. 
bu günler hiç günü başı götürmez. Doğrudan ayet edilen bu sen, ergen kadimlerge adavatım var, herle geçe var. Sölüp gitmeyken. Инициативная группа, наш центр называла Истеклала Влады. Это поколение будущего. В 2006 году мы открыли реабилитационный центр, шелтер для жертв домашнего насилия и жертв торговли людьми. Последние 2020 года мы начали работать с теми людьми, которые оказались в зоне военных конфликтов. Наше правительство вернуло это во время операции Мехар-1, Мехар-5, 5 операций было. Мы работаем теперь и с возвращенцами тоже. Meali yaş bu gemmen, bilme gemmen, hayatı kitikkenimizde. Irak'ta yaşayacağımız, yüzümüz var idi, maşına uzanmaz, pulumuz var idi. Sauda bulan şokulanardık, tadbır koruyduk. Uyuda magazini açgandık, kim keçek satardık. Kim evde şu yaşayıp bari etken dağımızda, rosa bombalar düşerdi, samolet uğrardı rosa. Portlaşlar. Portlaşlar bulardı. Kim bir gün bizimiz gem bomba tuşkan, biz nima bogemiz, cıra hata gände, kim balnitse gebar vda olan gemiz, apiratse bogemiz, neyim balan ukem, kim şunlan kim bizde abket işte nima gem, kama kana abket işte, kama kana da turdik, iki ilçe tur gemiz, erde umma şarayt bomba gemiz, gerçi karış mı gem, ama s Arapide biz vda kana get xoy umma teşkar gem çıkar mıstı. Tel dönmen çünmezdik ilerde telini. Ki in Özbekistanımız bizde kelep mekhar operasyası bulan ballar da kelde Özbekistan'a. Ya şu vreme говорю, когда мне говорят специалист или кто-либо с кем-либо беседу, она сама виновата или он сам виноват. Зачем в ИГИЛ надо было идти? Я им задаю вопрос. Покажите мне ИГИЛ на карте. Где ИГИЛ? Покажите мне на карте, что эта женщина захотела поехать в ИГИЛ. Покажите мне. Она бежала от проблем. Она бежала от семьи. От насилия бежала. Она бежала туда, где ее никто не знает. Поэтому ИГИЛ может быть завтра в Узбекистане, может быть в Таджикистане, может быть в Казахстане. Это вызов сообществу. Нужно работать с людьми. Хазар, манда телеграм группа бар. Бунда пашти гитмичдан артык, айнан жаслык зона аста буган махкумлар. Телеграм групп почкан ман, Узбекче да бу, жасықта жабырланганлар жамияты, 3G. Көпчілік азатлыққа чықты, жасық япылды, көпчілік азық мазыл колонияда өте япты. Колонияда, улар біләнам телефоны бар, хаммасымдан гаплашып тұраман. Обши, жүзден артық жасықта бұған адамларды біләман, улар білән алауқа даман, дойымей. Yine şu dini akım bu yön alış bu çap etkendi bizden hamamızda. Tuğrul yazımız yara şahibimiz olan çünkü ayıbımız ilimsizlik. Asasiyle olmuş ilimsizlikten. Bana yine asasiyle ki örgünü yapıyoruz, maşa ilimden. Gözümüz hatalarımız şunu yapıyoruz, yetip bile yapıyoruz. Ne akıyan hatalarımızda, ne akıyan hatalarımızda. Ozu hayatta aldığı insanın ne maksatı koysa, şu maksatı gerekir. Yani iş bu olaydı. 
Belki ben hayatta uyu kurmayan durmam, belki hayatta tayımda kanada bir ina merkez lasetti maşine yoldur. Lakin o zaman gaye maksadım ayıttım ve şu gaye maksadım yolu da oturdum. Şunun için ben kanada oturgenim ki açım değil mi? Lakin şu asosan manga küçük bir gün narsa şu ma hakikat çünkü Avrupa man, iyi mana hiç kandı evim yok. Mana bar bir keçerim sorab kaçandır mana akli dedi gün narsa. Hazırım şu narsa ki iş ona ma kaçandır. Moşt ertem, moşt bir yıldan ki, moşt bir yıl, on yıldan ki, bar bir mana nakaktan kamaqat şükürlerim, bar bir tan alınar bu, bu ne iş ona mı? Thank you so much. I want to now introduce our second speaker, Amina Humara. Before I do so, though, I want to remind people to please send in your questions, and you can do so one of three ways, um, by email, kenan at wilsoncenter.org, by Twitter at Kenan Institute, or by our Facebook page. So please, please do send those in now. Um, I'd like to introduce our other guest, Amina Umara. She is a graduate of Helen Harding Honors College at the University of Memphis, where she majored in psychology and minored in Russian. She is the daughter of Dr. Sanjar Umarov, a prominent Uzbek politician and businessman who founded Sunshine Uzbekistan, a pro-democracy organization that advocates for economic reforms. Because of his work, Dr. Umarov was imprisoned by the late president, Islam Karima. He eventually, received asylum in the United States, where he continues to support pro-democracy and human rights issues in Uzbekistan. Amina, please feel free to speak. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I wanna to begin today by extending my deepest gratitude to the Wilson and Oxus Society, the Kennan Institute, and most importantly, Noah and Jennifer for the invitation to speak today. Um, I'm here to share my personal experience witnessing these tragedies firsthand and to also honor the voice of my father. On October 22nd, 2005, during a business trip to Tashkent, um, my dad was abducted, forcibly injected into the neck with a psychotropic agent and then dragged into an unmarked vehicle. For the next three days, the authorities denied having him in their custody as my family let our search through nearby hospitals and morgues. Um, we had even sent people to the police station where he was being detained, where we were only met with denials. Um, later on October 25th, in response to mounting international pressure and extensive media coverage, the authorities finally issued a warrant acknowledging that he was held in custody at the same police station we had previously visited. When he was eventually allowed access to an attorney, um, he was discovered in a completely disoriented state with blood all over his jacket and unable to form any coherent thoughts. Um, his attorney, upon receiving a letter stating that his license would be revoked, seized working on my father's case in concern for his own safety and later fled the country seeking asylum in the United States. On the day before his trial, they positioned a car outside of his cell window and began pumping exhaust fumes in, leaving him to desperately gasp for air um, through the small slit beneath the door. And the exposure to these fumes impaired his cognitive abilities to the extent that he was unable to follow along with the proceedings of his trial the next day 
where he was then sentenced to pay fines amounting to $9.8 million and then received a sentence to 14 and a half years in jail. Uh, when he was transferred to a prison colony, he was immediately placed into solitary confinement. And what initially began as a 17-day sentence um, culminated in a 450-day stint in a 10 by 4 foot cell that was equipped with only an open toilet. Uh, later in October 2008, after the naturalization of my mother's U.S. citizenship, she announced that we would be visiting my father. And our trip was filled with challenges from the beginning. Um, at every single foreign layover, she was um, faced with repeated interrogations, leaving my sister and I alone, waiting for hours. And when we finally began the journey to the prison where he was held, um, I remember basic facilities like using the restroom were scarce. Um, we paid for access to just use mud holes in the ground. And the entirety of our 12 hour wait, the only food that we had available were just scraps of Uzbek bread. Um, after undergoing another round of security procedures, we were then led to a waiting room. And the man who walked through those doors was barely recognizable to me. Uh, his hair at that point was completely shaved. His skin was tightly drawn over his bones and voice was entirely gone. Every time he looked at me, there was absolutely no sign of recognition or trace of emotion. Um, I just remember his eyes that protruded from his starved face um, just stared blankly and didn't even acknowledge his own two daughters. Um, my sister and I, we were then six and 10 years old at the time, can still remember the utter shock and just terror that we faced when the prison guard assisted him um, to sit next to us. And my mother had strongly warned us that our father may look a little bit different, but we were so terrified that we had to be escorted out um, where we then waited alone for hours until our family was able to come pick us up. After this, um, there was a long drive back home and things escalated again at 11 p.m. when officers arrived at our doorstep and took my mother away for questioning. Uh, they threatened her, tore up her Uzbek passport, and hinted that her safety would soon be in jeopardy if we didn't leave the country right away. The next day, we visited the American embassy in Uzbekistan. Um, my sister and I gave our eyewitness testimonies, and, and thanks to the embassy support, and especially Ambassador Norland, they allowed us one additional visit to see my father again um, to what we believed would be our very last time so that we were able to say our final goodbyes. In the second process, it was quite familiar to me now. There was the hours of driving and waiting and then entry into the visiting area. But it was different in one key aspect. Um, I remember this time there was a window overlooking the walkway where the prisoners um, used to get by and I observed a horrifying, horrifying scene. The prisoners, including my father, were herded like cattle and with every step that they took, they had to lift their knees up to about stomach height, um, put their hands behind their back and bend over. And they were forced to walk like this everywhere they went. As he finally entered the room, um, I gave him a hug and I remember feeling the ribs protruding from his back because of the little fat and muscle mass that he had remaining at this point. Um, my mother had explained to him that this was his daughter. She just turned six recently and he was sat there completely unemotionless or completely emotionless. Um, his only form of communication to me at this point was gripping my hand um, because he was unable to speak and it was to me, a way of his soul saying that he was still there, maybe not on the outside because of his walking vegetative state at this point, but deep down, he was still there. Over the next two years, um, his physical condition deteriorated drastically. Um, he was frequently hospitalized and when he wasn't in solitary confinement, he required assistance for the most basic functions. Um, his ability to speak had vanished and he struggled with things like eating and sleeping. When the Red Cross was finally granted access to inspect the prison after being repeatedly denied, 
They're only shown healthier inmates and more presentable for parts of the facility. Um, the inmates accused of religious offenses were marked with red tags on their shirts with just complete numb and lifeless expressions. And I remember witnessing all this felt completely surreal. It was like a nightmare and a reminder of the realities that are still present in this world today. After extensive rehabilitation and prison hospitals aim to mask the severe deterioration of his health, we received a call from the US Embassy informing us of his imminent release after following a thaw in relations between the United States and Uzbekistan. Two days after this, there was an impromptu hearing held where the judge, out of the comfort of his out-of-court attire, ordered my father's release as if he was reading from a pamphlet. Um, luckily, now he is back in Memphis. And um, after watching this documentary and reflecting on the narratives in it, uh, it became painfully clear to me that these stories are not anomalies and they're not just tales of the past. Um, they're struggles of human dignity and justice that we are still facing to this day. And they reflect the deep suffering of thousands who remain trapped under oppressive regimes around the world. Um, I hope that we can collectively honor the voices in the unexonerated and the untold numbers that it represents. Um, the families, the victims, and the entire communities that are still hurting to this day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amina. Um, between the documentary and between your comments, your personal comments, having witnessed this, I mean, I can't say any more. Um, and I'm sure the audience feels equally just moved by what you said. And I, with that, I, I, I want to open up for questions for anyone who has questions. Noah or Amina or Noah and Amina collectively. Again, you can submit them one of three ways by email, by Twitter, and by Facebook. Question. We have our first question coming in. So our first question from Mitchell Pullman, he says, I was in Uzbekistan last summer observing elections, and we took a strong interest in the role of the Mahalas in Uzbek society. The Mahalas are the government-approved religious bodies that can be found in every neighborhood and village in Uzbekistan. Have any of the former prisoners approached the Mahalas for assistance at all? Have the Mahalas also been afraid to work on their behalf? I think that's a question for either of you could feel free to take. Um, Amina, do you want to start this one or do you want me to take this? You can take this one. Okay. Um, yeah, I find it um, in some ways, you know, the fact that I, as an American citizen, well, we're both American citizens, Amina and I, she was also born in the United States, but, you know, the the fact that I can, you know, I'm maybe better positioned to answer this um, than then her family is in a part already the answer. Um, Mahala committees, especially during the time um, under Karimov, were an agency of local governance, yes. Um, and they were widely celebrated in sort of Uzbek government um, in the Uzbek government's version of itself as a kind of, um, you know, autochthonous, uh, really um, sort of genuine local form of governance because, you know, Mahalas and the, the interrelationships that families have with one another um, around the basis of, you know, self original self-organized Mahalas really does have a long, um, a long legacy before the Soviet period of local governance. But, um, you know, there's been a lot of work um, done by you know, people like uh, Pauline Jones and others um, about, and uh, so Morgan Liu uh, has, has done great work at the anthropologist, Morgan Liu at Ohio State has done great work at how 
sort of what mahalas look like when they are self-generated in southern Kyrgyzstan as opposed to the way that they might look like within Uzbekistan. So this is all a long ellipsis to get around to saying the thing that, you know, mahalas are primarily an agency of local surveillance um, rather than of local governance. And so the committees themselves, while there have been, you know, some notable reforms that have happened in the past years, um, they are not, the structure of governance remains, they're not, I would say, really able to advocate um, for people, in particular people um, who are in this kind of situation, whose rights are sort of under question, whose citizenship is under question, um, you know, they're not generally an organization, while, while they are, they're not generally an organization that can advocate for people to advance their own legal rights within the system. Um, they have, historically, they have much more been an organization that can gather information um, about people and report it to the security services. So, you know, we can say, looking back at the Karimov era, the Mahala committees were a key organ um, in this repression, unfortunately. Um, you know, I think there are, I think the reforms that have happened in, in the last six years or so have been genuine. Uh, I guess it's been a bit more than that. It's 2024 already. Um, you know, these reforms are genuine, but there are a lot of questions about what role Mahala committees play sort of within the government. There have been a lot of changes about what ministry they're sort of nested within. Um, but what remains is, you know, a, a kind of consistent cooperation with security services. And, you know, unfortunately, in this case, the security services just are not institutionally designed to help restore people's rights. Um, as much as those rights may be real and as much as those rights may be actionable, um, you know, there, there is a lot said about the idea that, you know, these are the so the lowest level of local governance, the way that city councils or neighborhood committees are, you know, in other um, democratic countries. But I would say we're not at the point um, where we're there yet, where they can advocate for people. It's very possible that the intention to get them to that point is real. And I think we should take seriously, you know, expressions of intention to that. But unfortunately, uh, we're just not there yet, in my experience. Thank you, Noah. And Mina, did you want to add in anything or maybe even picking up on the point that was brought up several times in the documentary about, you know, certain people reaching out for help, whether it was to family or organizations and not finding a response? Can you maybe add it all into that? Did your family try to reach out, whether to a mahala or whether to someone else or something else? Um, so during the time that my father was imprisoned, um, my family, my siblings, my mother and I were residing in Memphis, Tennessee. So it was a little bit more restrictive in the sense of being able to reach out to, um, I guess, family and authority members in Uzbekistan. I do know that my mother has spoken about um, her trying to reach out to family and lifelong friends that she had growing up during all of this that were residing in Tashkent at the time. Um, and it was, she was met with a cold shoulder. Um, and it wasn't until her naturalization in 2008, um, when we were able to go back over there that we kind of had that extra layer of protection from the US government. Um, because my sister and I, we were both US citizens by that point, And my mother was as well. Um, so it was more so, I would say, backing that we had from the states rather than um, any sort of reliance that we could use um, as far as Uzbekistan was at that point for us. Thank you. That's a great answer. And actually builds on the, the next question we have <clears throat> that has come in. And again, encourage our audience. We, we still have a you know, good five, seven minutes to send in some questions. Um, this question, have you had any contact, and this would be for Amina, have you had any contact with or been able to develop relationships with any other children who are in similar situations as you with parents or close family members in prison? You know, and if so, how has that impacted you? Um, I have not. I grew up outside of a suburb of Memphis, Tennessee, and so 
I was speaking to Noah about this last week. Um, I've never met anybody actually from the region of Central Asia until this past week that wasn't a family member or a family friend. Um, so no, I've never experienced that. Um, especially not somebody that has gone through kind of like a similar situation where it's almost an added layer because my family immigrated over to the U.S. Um, and so I think growing up, it was really difficult for me because it kind of already made me feel like an outcast, um, you know, being different than everybody else that I was growing up with. And I think in recent years, I've kind of used it um, to my advantage because I feel like there isn't enough, um, there aren't enough voices advocating for rights in that region, especially from people that are able to, that have come from a, a dual background, having parents that were both born over there yet growing up in the US. Uh, so having the opportunity to speak about this has been really healing and important to me um, because, you know, there may be a six-year-old girl right now whose father is in that exact situation or has been in that exact situation and she has no one to turn to and um, nowhere to voice these feelings that she's going through. So um, I think that goes to answer that question. No, thank you. I mean, and that actually leads me to maybe a follow-up question for both of you. Um, the number is staggering, correct? 18,000 people. And so maybe, Noah, why? And, and actually, Amina, maybe your answer gives it when you said it the first time you'd met someone from Central Asia was when you were, you know, that wasn't family or friends was when you were in D.C. in the past week. But, you know, maybe both of you, why do you think this is an issue that hasn't received more international, whether domestic coverage in the U.S. or international coverage? What do you think is the cause of that? Because there's certainly a lot of people who have been infected by it. Do you want to start, Amina, or do you want to do you want to add? I'll, I'll follow you. I'll add to it. Um, I would say, you know, I, I think this won't come as a surprise, you know, based on some of the things that we've said. But I, I, I think that um, there is still, I think we we hear in some of the different versions of personal life narratives that are told, you know, within the film, we can feel the tension um, between people who, between people who are afraid to speak even about their own experiences, about their own biographies, afraid that their neighbors, you know, will even know more about who they are as if they, you know, they didn't know already, um, or to make a, to draw any public attention um, to this. I think, you know, one of the real tensions in, in both in the making of this film and in releasing it now, and a, actually kind of a great unknown um, that I respect all of our respondents um, for, you know, in, for facing head on and, and bearing under is this, we don't really know uh, what happens to people who tell these stories yet. Um, and I think that is, you know, yeah, it is, it's 18,000 people um, who have been released, have gone through those things. There's even more um, who were released under earlier amnesties. You know, for example, um, Sanjarake's story, the Umara family story, um, doesn't actually fall within, you know, this because they, he was, he, they fell among, you know, one of these earlier amnesties after years in prison and, you know, near death, you know, being released even before the, the, these 18,000 came. So it's not just 18,000. Uh, it's, it's many, many hundreds more, if not thousands more. And we don't even have numbers. We don't have a real sense um, of how many people this was. Um, and we also have many people who continue to remain inside. Actually, some of the, you know, as wonderful as these reforms are, um, some of the most heavily criticized and most notorious cases of people being abused in custody or their family members being abused have not been released. 
um, under these amnesties uh, in part, I think because the cost is so high for admitting that all of that was a mistake. Um, there's an imam uh, who was arrested and I won't, I won't mention their name just to protect their family's privacy, but I, I've interviewed this family in Turkey where they were living as undocumented immigrants because they had fled Uzbekistan. He still remains in prison, to my knowledge, since 2004, I believe, um, when he wouldn't confess to his supposed crimes of extremism. Uh, someone broadly understood by the international community to be a member of the Uzbek security services, raped his six-year-old daughter and then brought him that information and uh, at which point he confessed so that that would stop to just protect his family. He remains in prison uh, and his family remains um, afraid to, to return to Uzbekistan despite all of the reforms. And so there is, as much as I think it's our duty to praise um, the changes that have been made and you know these really cardinal reforms i want to you know our, our goal with this film and our goal with being here today is to both recognize that and praise it and give credits where it's due and then at the same time hold in tension the fear that so many of those who were released continue to live under and the cases of some who are still not released um, because admitting what had happened to them would require you know, would require recognizing some real depths um, that at this point we're not at. So we we have a ways to go as much as we want to celebrate what's happened so far. I think it's important also, and I feel like I, as a person, to the people who have told me these stories, I owe it to them um, to continue to hold these things in tension. And I want to give Amina the, the last word in, in this. Um, I'll be quick. There's two points that I had to add to that. Um, one would be in the documentary, it says that several of the prisoners that were released had to sign non-disclosure agreements about what happened to them in prison. So, of course, with that being done and put into place, it's difficult to hear about their stories. There's very few people that, one, are willing to advocate um, about this, and two, that are even able to do it legally. Um, my second point that I wanted to make, too, was that, you know, we hear in this documentary about um, everyone that is released and the just the deep societal issues that they're having to face um, reintegrating back. Um, and so speaking out about this, once you're already having to just find work to be able to live and make food and survive, um, I think it's hard to think about, okay, let me advocate for this when I'm, I've just been released and I'm just trying to stand on my own two feet. I think it's, a, I, I'm definitely, I would say, I'm extremely privileged to be in a spot where I am able to speak about this and do so in a way where I don't have to fear for my life. And I, I really can't say that there are many people out there that are in that same position. You know, both of your comments were so important. Um, as you're saying, I'll start with it. You know, Mina first. Um, why should we put the burden on the people who are undergoing these horrific things to then be the advocates for their circumstances? And then back to to Noah. You know, you're very rightly so. You know, you, with numbers, we always know that the numbers are much higher, right? When it's cases that are difficult to capture. So, eighteen thousand does not capture, as you said, that that horrific example you gave of the. The, the gentleman and his six-year-old daughter. And, and again, we know with so many stories between Amina's and between that, there are so many more that we, we don't know about. So uh, I am so grateful to both of you for showing the documentary, for sharing your comments. We are we're about five minutes over time, so we're gonna need to wrap up, but I do wanna give each of you, if you have any last words you wanna give to our audience, maybe Noah and then Amina, any, any parting comments? Um, I would just like to thank you again for inviting me to speak today. And um, now I wanted to ask you this question. Um, if you had anything to say or a question that we wish we had asked you, what would it be and what would your answer be? <laughs> okay, so this is the question that I closed our last session with the meetup with. So I'm glad that this question is getting passed on. I didn't invent it, but it is my favorite interview question. Um, 
I guess, I mean, I, I think the question underlying all of this is, you know, what do we do now, now that we've seen this? Um, what what can we do? Um, and I don't entirely know the answer to that question. Um, so I, I invite, you know, all of you who are watching now and, and all of you who now have this information, I guess, to, to think about that. You know, what is it that we can do um, in about... 10 days, uh, I'm going to get to go back to Jizak, where a lot of this was filmed. I'm going to meet Azam John. I'm going to meet Nazifa. I'm going to meet with a lot of these other folks. Um, you know, and, and I hope that um, I want to ask them that question too. You know, what, what can we do with this? I don't want to take that the moment, you know, of this to say, um, while, you know, we are just the people who can be here today uh, for this because it's, uh, my brain doesn't do math good right now because I'm jet lagged myself, but it's like four o'clock in the morning in Uzbekistan right now. Um, we could not have done any of this without Umida Akhmedova, uh, who did the incredible, not only did the incredible cinematography for this film, but also did herself about half of these interviews. Um, you know, really, if there was... Um, if if uh, if there's full credit, you know, on this that that needs to be given, this is as much her film as it is mine or or anyone else's, um, and she has her own experience um, of being repressed within the Uzbek justice system, and so just the incredible bravery um, that she went into all of this with is is something that I am in awe of, um, and she's just one of the one of the sharpest and kindest people and the best artists that I've ever met. Um, so I, I please support her work in any way that you can and support the work um, of Nazifa Kamalova and her organization um, that are featured in this as well, who spend you know, every resource that they have helping people, not just former prisoners, but victims of domestic abuse, people who are returnees from Syria, you know, truly the least of these in Uzbek society. So I, I really encourage you um, if there's, you know, if there's an answer to my question about what can we do now, I think it's to support people like that, um, artists like Umida, and um, and activists like Nazifa. Um, you know, they're they're both probably the closest to saints of anyone I've ever met. To borrow from both the Christian and the Islamic tradition <laughs> in this case, um, and I, I really. You know, they at times struggle um, on the edge of survival with their work and their activism. And so I, I think if we can bring anything out of this, if we can support them, um, I think that would be that would be wonderful and it would make a real difference in this situation. Thank you both so much. Thank you, Amina and Noah, um, for the documentary and for your comments. I want to thank the OXA Society for Central Asian Affairs for supporting this. And I also want to thank all of our audience members. Um, we're very appreciative of everyone's interest in Central Asia and hope that you will take to heart the comments that Noah and Amina said about taking this message forward and spreading it to others. So thank you, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.